please stand for the reading of the written word. On page 14, we have the written word this morning, starting from the Old Testament, Leviticus 10, 1 through 3. Now Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer and put fire in it and laid incense on it and offered unauthorized fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. And fire came out from before the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, this is what the Lord has said. Among those who are near me, I will be sanctified, and before all the people, I will be glorified. And Aaron held his peace. Psalm 92, 1 through 4. It is good to give thanks to Yahweh, to sing praises to your name, O Most High, to declare your steadfast love in the morning and your faithfulness by night, to the music of the lute and the harp, to the melody of the lyre. For you, O Lord, have made me glad by your work. At the works of your hands I sing for joy. Psalm 115, 1. Not to us, Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory. For the sake of your steadfast love and faithfulness. Psalm 145, 1 through 5, and then 8 through 10 and 21. I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall commend your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. On the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works, I will meditate. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all, and his mercy is over all that he has made. All your works shall give thanks to you, O Lord, and all your saints shall bless you. My mouth will speak the praise of the Lord, and let all flesh bless his holy name forever and ever. Isaiah 6.3 and one seraphim called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is Yahweh of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24. Thus says the Lord, Let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches. But let him who boasts boast in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who practices covenantal love, justice, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, declares the Lord. From the New Testament, Matthew 5, 16. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Matthew twenty eight nineteen. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations baptizing them into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Luke 1, 46 through 55. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on all generations will count me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted the humble, uh, uh, those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his offspring forever. And lastly, Romans 11:33 through 36. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. So far, God's written word. Our great God, you have called us here this day to hear your word and to respond with praise. We ask, O Lord, that we should more fully understand this petition of the Lord's Prayer, that your name is to be made holy, honored, and glorified. And we should do so with thankful hearts and with sincerity, that you may receive the glory and praise in all the earth. We ask this through Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. God has revealed himself to men. And unfortunately, most men have not wanted to see or know God because that would have forced us to deal with this reality. 
We are not God. And so when God gave abundantly in the Garden of Eden, when there was no competition, no enemies, no danger whatsoever, Adam and Eve were still not satisfied because there is something about us that we are not content with the knowledge that God is God and worthy of praise, and we actually are offended by that. And then add to that that since the sin, since the fall and competition and everything else, our bitterness has only grown. And so the catechism lays out for us this reality. All men have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Every one of us should take out of our minds this sense of, I'm not as bad as others. At least I try to do good. My intents are good. No, they're not. Ultimately, unless you want God glorified, it is your heartfelt desire that God should be known and worshipped and adored, then you have already sinned. And then we add the specific sins to that. So that's what the first part of the catechism reveals. All have sinned. But it doesn't stop there. Because what God wants us to know is how loving, how merciful, and how gracious he is. So he has us know our sin in order that we would understand grace. If we don't know our sin, we might think of God actually finding beauty in us or rewarding us. And then we would really not have a full appreciation of the cross of Jesus Christ. But when we understand our sin then we realize that God has come not to a beautiful people, not to a people that had potential for good, but rather he came to his very enemies, to you and me, to our forefathers who hated him, who sinned against him. And instead of punishing us, he gave us life. He took our burdens, our sins, our guilt on himself. He died the sinner's death while we were his enemies. And he granted to us everlasting life. And then by his spirit, he raised us up from the dead, united us to Christ. We are now brought together in the church. We enjoy all the benefits of having God as father, even though we rebelled against him. And so we know our guilt. We know God's grace. And now that God has made us to be his children, he intends for us to learn how to be his children. He trains us up, and that's what the church's job is, to preach the word, the full counsel of God, so that we would understand how we are to worship, how we are to live. And that's why we now come to the third part of the catechism, gratitude. So the world says, you're okay, you've done a few things wrong. If you do enough good, then good things will happen to you. The scriptures say, you are evil. You've only done wickedness, and yet the greatest good has occurred, so now be thankful. So we are called to good works, not to earn a reward, but to respond in thankfulness to God. So we've already gone through the Ten Commandments, and now we come to the Lord's Prayer. And as we saw, prayer is the chief form of gratitude we owe to God, because this expresses our faith in Him. It recognizes Him as a personal God and not some vague force. And so we respond by praising God, and we saw last week by calling him our Heavenly Father, seeing and knowing that he has chosen to relate to us, not as a judge, not as a powerful force, but as a loving Father who holds his little children. And today we are going to look at the first petition, hallowed be thy name. This is the old way of speaking, but in modern English, Let your name be glorified, praised, made holy, set apart, and honored. So that is why we read these scripture passages. First, let us make sure that we understand what dishonoring his name means. It means thinking of God, not according to the way he's revealed himself, but according to the way you want him to be. For that, we look at uh, Leviticus 10. Here are Nadab and Abihu, two of Aaron's four sons. They are called to be priests of God, a great honor in all the world. And they got excited and they decided that they would approach God the way that any priest would. They would do something glorious and magnificent. And so they put, uh, they took a censer, they put in the incense, they put the coals of fire on it. And what was God's response? God was angry with them. Why? 
You would think that these people are going to show an act of worship and devotion to God. Why would he be angry? Because God is not our servant. We are his servants. We are his children. We need to know and understand his mind. We are not going to tell him, here's what we're going to do and you're going to like it. Rather, we wait for him to speak to us and say, here is how you will approach so that you will be able to show me the right honor. And Nadab and Abihu, they offered, as it says, unauthorized fire. Not that incense wasn't allowed, the timing was wrong, and they were killed for it. And many people will see this and say, "Uh, I don't want this kind of a God. Too bad. This is the only God that exists. So we need to recognize what this means for us. What it means first and foremost is we can only approach God in the way that he is ordained. And Jesus says he is the way. That means to approach God in our works would yield this destruction that we see on Nadab and Abihu. But if we come in the authorized way through Jesus Christ by faith alone, then we will be received and blessed. And when we do, then you see what God says, then I will be glorified. This is important. Look at Psalm 92. The psalmist says, I, or it is good to give thanks to Yahweh, to God, to sing praises to your name, O Most High, and to declare your steadfast love and your faithfulness, morning and night. What does this mean? The psalmist recognizes that God is worthy of being thanked and praised. And notice what it says, because you are faithful and you have love. Now, we tend to think of glorifying someone because they have power. We admire beauty. We are jealous of riches. We are in awe of power. But God says, I want you to know me as the loving, merciful God who made a promise to save and did fulfill my promise. And that's the great privilege that you will have. And going to Jeremiah 9, notice what he says. Look, I don't want you to be proud of, boast in, or look up to wisdom or might or riches. I want you to be most filled with joy, most thrilled about this, that you understand and know me. Of course, the only way that could happen is if God reveals himself, if we would listen to the teacher and we would respond. And what is it that God wants us to know about him? that he practices covenantal love, justice, and righteousness, and really delights in doing these things, that he's not doing them under compulsion. So what is it that we need to know? God wants us to be thankful. God wants us to praise him, but not the way the pagans do. They create idols and praise their gods of power. So they pray to their gods, let us defeat the enemy. Let us find gold when we dig this mine. Let us make sure that we survive the winter. Whatever it is, it's all about force and power. And God says, I want you to rejoice in this, that you know I am a God who made a promise to have you as my people, to purchase you and to keep you forever. I want you to delight in this, that you got to know me as that God. And then when we have that, Look at what Jesus says in Matthew 5. Then you will let your light shine before others so that when they see that God's spirit is in you and he is transforming you, they will see your good works and then give glory to your father who is in heaven. And then the calling he gives to his apostles, therefore the church at the end of Matthew 28. So go and now make disciples of all nations, marking them, baptizing them, into the name of the Father, Son, and the Spirit. And those people then would hear this call, let your light shine in the whole world, that even the unbelievers would see and know that God is your Father and give him glory. So God considers it very important that he be known and recognized, that he be worshipped and glorified. But as opposed to what we would think, he simply wants to be known because he's the powerful God. Or the way the world has done it. It's all about strength, power, ability to enforce your will on others. God wants to be known as the compassionate God 
who looks upon his enemies and loves them, takes on their flesh and purchases them and delivers them to everlasting life. And the ones whom he chooses are not the rich and the powerful. In fact, that's specifically why in Jeremiah he says, I'm not interested in the wise, the rich, and the powerful. Paul in 1 Corinthians tells the Corinthians, not many of you were rich and powerful or wise in the world when you were called. Who does God want? He wants those who know and understand. We're descended from a sinful race, and yet we are going to inherit everlasting life because God is gracious, and therefore we give thanks to him. So that's what we saw in Psalm 92 already, giving thanks to God because of his steadfast love and his faithfulness to his promises. Psalm 145, I will extol you, my God and King, blessing your name forever and ever, blessing you and praising your name forever and ever. And then notice what he says, verse 4. One generation shall commend, brag, boast in your works to the next generation, declaring your mighty acts, the glorious splendor of your majesty. And then verse 8, he expands further, that you are the God who has worked out gracious and merciful redemption. That's not what anybody else praises in this world. I mean, on occasion, especially when you know somebody is not judging you as you deserve, you might be thankful. But overall, we don't build statues for the gracious and the merciful. The ones who are honored are conquerors, inventors, but rarely ever the mother of the handicapped child. Rarely ever the one who was willing to spend years and years at some useless outpost in a poverty-stricken area and just taking care of the poor and the sick. But notice what God says. We are to praise him, extol and bless his name because, verse 8 of Psalm 145, because Yahweh is gracious, merciful, slow to anger, overflowing in covenantal love good to all, and his mercy over his whole creation. And so all your works will give thanks to you, and the saints, the redeemed ones, will praise you. And then verse 21, so my mouth will speak the praise of the Lord. So let all creation, all flesh, bless his holy name forever and ever. Well, what is it that we now know that others didn't? We know the way in which God expresses his mercy and his grace. He never forsakes justice, and so he had to die on the cross. And that's what Mary is celebrating. So when Mary sings this song of praise, she is quoting a number of Old Testament references, particularly the Psalms. Why? Because she knows she is a nobody. She is a poor, unknown girl in some obscure tribe of an insignificant nation. And yet, what does God do? God chooses to send the Redeemer. God chooses to take on our flesh. And he doesn't go to the house of the rich, but to the poor. And where does he go? To the place where he made the promise. Through Abraham and the patriarchs, he made a promise to the nation of Israel that there would be a rescue. And Mary says, therefore, it is my job now that I will glorify the Lord. And the world will know that God chose this humble woman through whom to bring redemption. And so you can see this excitement that exists there. And now in Romans, as Paul has spoken of the doctrine of predestination and of uh, God preserving his saints, He says, oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments. How inscrutable his ways. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Who has been his counselor? Or who has given a gift to him that God would have to repay him or give him his wages? No, none of that. Rather, from God, through God and to God are all things. So to him be the glory forever and ever. So you see there this biblical pattern being expanded of this phrase, hallowed be your name. Let your name be set apart to be considered holy and to be glorified and praised. 
So what do we mean when we say that? So you see there on page 15, Catechism question 122, what does this p petition mean? Hallowed be your name means help us to truly know you. First important thing, you can't really want and desire God to be glorified unless you know who God is as he's revealed himself. And then having known him, to honor him, glorify him, and praise him for every one of his works, creation and redemption, and for all that shines forth from them. How we see his omnipotence, how we see his wisdom, his care and detail and love all fulfilled. Your almighty power, wisdom, kindness, justice, mercy, and truth. And it also means help us to direct all of our living, whatever we think, whatever we say, whatever we do, so that not so on account of us, your name would never be blasphemed, but rather on account of what people see in us, they would honor and praise your name, even if they don't much like Christians. We should be such that even the worst enemy of the church should have no choice but to admit there is something about this person. There is something about you. I don't know who your God is, but how it is you can be patient and kind and merciful and love the poor and care for the sick. I may not believe yet, but I certainly have reason to think there's some kind of power in you. So when we say, hallowed be your name, it is most unfortunate if we say this prayer kind of as a ritual, thinking our praying these words without sincerity is what we need to do. That's what Nadab and Abihu did. They thought external actions, divorce from conformity to God's revelation was fine. Because the idols are fine with that. Remember, idols just light a candle, leave an egg, whatever gift you do. No, that's not how God is. God is the personal God who reveals what pleases him. And he announces to you the good he will do. And he wants you to respond to that. So when you and I say, God, may your name be holy. You're essentially saying to God, if I should think, say, or do something that brings dishonor on your name, curse me. Because I'm saying it is right in all creation for your name to be praised. Your enemies will blaspheme your name. So if I say, think, or do things that blaspheme his name, I am calling curses on my head. So we should not only pray with sincerity, but with understanding. If we want God's name to be holy, you see that in the second half of the answer, it means help me to direct my way of living, what I am thinking, what I am saying, and what I am doing, so that your name will never be insulted, blasphemed, or mocked because of me, but rather that because I sincerely desire your name would be rightly revered and honored, that people seeing me, hearing me speak, would actually honor and praise your name. So this is actually quite a weighty statement that we make. It is insufficient for us to do this in the way of the world. I'm going to honor you by building something, and then I'm going to go do what I want to do. Remember, God made heaven and earth. There's no building we can make, no statue, no amount of gold that's going to impress him. He wants your heart. He wants you to actually know and understand you are a guilty sinner, saved by grace, and now being prepared to be the temple of God where his spirit dwells. He wants you to rejoice in that, be thankful for it, and recognizing the spirit of God makes where he is holy that you desire to grow in holiness. And this means knowing and worshiping God rightly, but also fulfilling all of your obligations and loving your neighbor, according to what we read in Romans 12, with a sincere love, blessing even your enemies who persecute you, leaving it to God to judge, instead seeking to do good to others. And you see there where Jesus says, let your light shine so that the world will see and know that you are my disciples. So, beloved, it is unfortunate that many, including us, we reduce our Christian faith to an external religion where we do certain things and then we're done. It's not. It's an entirely new calling. It's like becoming a soldier. It's like getting married. 
you no longer have your old station or status. You are now in a new relationship with all new obligations. And now we are called to love God, having understood him and desiring that in everything we do, the rest of the world would know him and glorify him. Let's pray. We ask, O oh God, that we would rightly understand what it means to hallow, to glorify your name, that we should not take lightly this prayer, but instead, knowing what a great blessing it is to know you, that because we now have life, that it would be our desire that people all over the world would hear of you, know you, understand and glorify your name, and that you would continue to build your church and that indeed the whole world would be filled with your glory. And we thank you that even now you've revealed yourself to us this way. Amen.